Okay, um, it's about time, and I would like to start. Uh, Mr. and um, at this moment, still Mr. on uh, at LCX PhD defense, and uh, the defense will take. A, a, actually, we have two hour time slot, but uh, in reality, maybe uh, his presentation is something around the forty five minutes around roughly, and then we have a kind of deep discussion to evaluate whether he is eligible uh, to earn the PhD or not. Okay, and. Uh, uh, Mr. Elsarek uh, started his work in 2000, uh, 2019 in the University of Tsukuba, and uh, he developed a new OCD technology which can labelfully visualize the tissue activity, or technically it's an intracellular motility. And he developed the algorithm and the method and then applied it uh, for the two more spheroid evaluation. And, uh, he, and as far as I understood, he established uh, this field. And uh, today uh, he is going to explain uh, his, say, PhD work about the development of the new OCT technology and also its application to the tumor sphere evaluation. And the thesis title is Optical Coherence Tomography Based Tissue Dynamics Imaging Method and its application to uh, tumor sphere evaluation. And uh, Ibrahim, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so then, yeah, please share screen and uh, please go ahead. Okay, uh, the, so uh, all the committee is here, right? Yep. Okay, we can proceed. So so, please. Uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Uh, by okay, the way, yes. Uh, for committees, uh, if you have questions, you can actually cut in uh, to the presentation. Uh, maybe it's uh, more effective to discuss as during the presentation, not having a deep discussion only at the end uh, or the, uh, only after the presentation, but uh, we can cut in. Okay, uh, sorry for disturbance. Please go ahead, Ibrahim. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Isson, for the uh, introduction. And uh, today I'm going to present my uh, final thesis defense, which is entitled uh, Optical Coherence Tomography Based Tissue Dynamics Imaging Method and its Application to Tumor Spread Evaluation. And I'm Ibrahim Abdel Sadiq, a PhD student at the University of Tsukuba under uh, supervision of uh, Professor Yoshiaki Isson. So uh, here is my presentation outlines. So I first uh, start with the introduction of uh, my talk, and then I will explain our method for the cross-sectional dynamics OCT imaging. And I will uh, then explain some validation studies of the cross-sectional dynamics OCT. And then I will uh, explain about our extension for the uh, method to be uh, capable for the three-dimensional dynamics imaging. And I will explain some uh, validation studies of the, cross uh, of the uh, three-dimensional dynamics imaging. And uh, then I will do the discussion and the conclusion. Uh, let me start with the introductions. Uh, tumors, including cancer, are one of the most fatal diseases worldwide. And the cancer have several types based on based on uh, which cell type became cancerous. So, so uh, the cancer types varies from patient to patient. And mimicking the human solid tumor by an ex vivo culture, uh, so-called tumor spread, is useful for understanding the tumor biology. In addition, the tumor spheroid is useful for anti-cancer drug selection for individual patients. In this method, we can extract the tumor cells from a real patient and cultivate it as a tumor uh, cell spheroid. And by applying different drugs to this spheroid and evaluate the spheroid response, we can optimally select the anti-cancer drug and apply it to the patient. There are several conventional methods have been used for the tumor spheroid drug response evaluation, such as bright field microscopy, and fluorescence microscopy. Although these methods are the gold standard, they have several limitations. Bright field microscopy provides cross-sectional imaging with a limited penetration depth and low quantitative capability. And fluorescence imaging is invasive by using an exogenous contrast agent. In addition, it provides cross-sectional imaging with a limited penetration depth of a few hundred micrometers. So, what are the rare requirements for the tumor spheroid evaluation? At first, spheroid is a living tissue, and we need to do a time course evaluation. So we need a labor-free and non-destructive modality. In addition, spheroid is a sick tissue with a few millimeter diameter. So we need uh, to, to have a high penetration depth imaging modality, as well as spheroid is a 3D tissue, so we need a three-dimensional measurement. All of these requirements are satisfied in optical coherence tomography, OCT, which is low coherence interferometric imaging modality, provide a label-free imaging 
with a few millimeter imaging penetration depths and uh, it is three dimensional. Optical coherence tomography fills the gap between the conventional ultrasound and the confocal microscopy. The ultrasound provides a few centimeter imaging penetration but with a low resolution and the confocal microscopy provides a few hundred micrometer uh, imaging penetration depths but with a high resolution for a range of one micrometer. So optical coherence tomography stands in between and it provides a few millimeter imaging penetration depths with a relatively high resolution of a range of a 10 micrometer. The recent OCT devices are Fourier domain OCT and the Fourier domain OCT has two variations. The first one is a spectral domain OCT. Here the light source is a broadband light source and the signal detection is done by using a high speed spectrometer. The light goes from the broadband light source and it is split by the fiber coupler to the reference and the sample arm. And these two beams are back reflected from the reference mirror and the sample and recoupled again at the fiber coupler and the interference signal is detected by the spectrometer. By the signal analysis, the one-dimensional depth profile of the sample is obtained and by scanning the sample by the mirror which is in the sample arm, by one-dimensional scanning of this uh, uh, mirror, we can obtain a two-dimensional uh, structure profile of the sample, a two-dimensional structural image of the uh, sample, which is called uh, OCTB scan. The second variation of the uh, Fourier domain OCT is swept source OCT. And the interference scheme and the scanning is similar to the spectral domain OCT. But in these systems, the light is a tunable light source where, where uh, the wavelength is sweeping along the time. And the signal detection is done by, by using a photo detector. Optical coherence tomography has been widely used for several clinical applications such as ophthalmology, endoscopy, cellular resolution microscopy, and dermatology. Although optical coherence tomography has this uh, wide uh, applications in the clinical uh, studies, so optical coherence tomography has one limitation. The standard OCT can visualize the sample structure, but it is not sensitive for the tissue activity imaging. So we need a new contrast, which could be capable for the uh, tissue activity evaluation. This contrast is so-called Dynamics OCT, and it is proposed for the tissue activity imaging. There are several demonstrations of the OCT uh, Dynamics imaging. In 2012, Farhad developed a method to uh, visualize the difference in the dynamics in the uh, tumor region and the normal region of mouse skin tumor, which is a combination between scanning OCT and the autocorrelation analysis. In this method, they repeated uh, 1,600 uh, frames with, with a frame repeating a uh, time of 5 milliseconds and computed the autocorrelation around the delay uh, range. And then they can uh, visualize the decorrelation time map as shown here. But this method provides cross-sectional dynamics imaging. In 2015, Oldenburg uh, developed a method for the uh, visualization of the dynamics of uh, epithelial cell organoids which is co-cultured with fibroblast. And this method depends on the uh, inverse power spectral law of the, uh, of the uh, spectral density of the fluctuation of the OCT sequence. In this method, the also repeats 350 frames with a 1.1 uh, uh, second uh, frame repeating time. And this method is also uh, provide cross-sectional dynamics imaging only. The high resolution full field dynamics OCT has been also proposed and it has been used for the fresh ex, ex vivo uh, mouse organs uh, visualization. So here we can see the uh, dynamics in the single cell in the fresh ex vivo rat liver. And this method use, uh, repeats uh, 1000 frames with a frame uh, repeating time of uh, 7.2 milliseconds with a high resolution, but it provides only emphasis imaging. The dynamics contrast with the scanning OCT has been also proposed. And in this image, we can see a clear uh, like a difference in the dynamics along the mouse tongue layers. And this method repeats 150 frames with a 9.2 millisecond frame repeating time. But this method is also cross-sectional. The dynamics micro-optical coherence tomography uh, with a time frequency analysis can be also uh, used for the visualization of the human esophageal biopsies. 
and this method uh, repeats uh, 1,000 frames with a 12, uh, 25 uh, millisecond frame repeating time. So all of these methods are cross sections. There are uh, some demonstration for the volumetric dynamics imaging, such as the measurement of the three-dimensional retinal organoid by using dynamics full field OCT. But this method of 512 frames at each location in the tissue. So the volumetric acquisition by using this method requires several minutes. The dynamic scanning OCT has been also uh, used for the volumetric acquisition of the mouse liver dynamics. And this method repeats 150 frames at each location in the tissue in 1.4 seconds. So the volumetric acquisition using this method also requires few minutes. The human retinal layer dynamics has been uh, successfully visualized with the combination of autocorrelation analysis and the high-speed high adaptive optics OCT system. So this method provides a fast volumetric acquisition, but it requires an uh, elaborate ultra-fast OCT systems. So our purpose in this study is to de develop a tissue activity imaging method by combining the high-speed swept source OCT and statistical analysis algorithm. So this method is capable for the three-dimensional dynamics imaging in a reasonable acquisition time of less than one minute. And the validation of the utility of our method for the three-dimensional tumor steroid evaluation under the time course and drug response studies will be presented. So let me explain about our method for the cross-sectional dynamics OCT. Our method is based on the rapid acquisition of the OCT time sequence at the same location in the tissue. And the signal analysis has been performed by two algorithms. The first one is a logarithmic intensity variance, LIV, which is the time variance of the log scale intensity. And why we use the log? To explain about this, let me model the intensity as I equal SD, where S is a static signal magnification and D is a signal dynamics. So once we take the log and compute the variance, we are going to obtain LIV, which is sensitive to the magnitude of the fluctuation of the dynamic signal component. Our second contrast is the OCT correlation decay speed, OCDS. And why we proposed OCDS? It's simply because of the limitation of the LIV method. To explain about this, let me introduce these two signals. They have the same fluctuation magnitude, but different fluctuation speeds. So these two signals are going to give us the same LIV. However, the speed of the dynamics behind is totally different. So, we propose the OCDS method to be capable for measuring the speed of the dynamics. We shift the signal in time and compute the autocorrelation along the delay time. And by fitting the, the slope of the autocorrelation decay curve at early delay times, we obtain early OCDS, OCDSE, which is sensitive for the slow and fast dynamics of the tissue. And by fitting the slope at the late delay times, we can obtain late OCDS, OCDSL, which is sensitive only for the slow dynamics of the tissue. During this study, we used our previously built 1.3 micrometer sweep source OCT system with a 50 kilohertz acquisition speed and 18 and 14 micrometer uh, lateral and depth resolution. And it is not worthy that our system is polarization sensitive. However, the polarization sensitivity of our system is not used in this study, which means that our method is compatible with the standard OCT uh, systems. For the acquisition, we repeated 350 frames in 4.4 seconds with a 12.8 uh, millisecond frame repeating time. To validate our method, we organized two studies. The first study is a time course evaluation of the tumor spread tissue activity. And the second study is a visualization of the steroid anti-cancer drug response. So let me start with the first study. In this study, we used a human breast adenocarcinoma steroid MCF7 cell line. We seeded the tumor cells at day zero, and after 15 days, a steroid of a diameter around 250 micrometer is formed. And we extracted the steroid from the cultivation on this day and measured it by using OCT every two hours up to 28 hours. It is not worthy that during the cultivation, the steroid have been cultured in a culture room with CO2 supply. But once we started the OCT measurement, 
the sample have been measured in a room temperature without CO2 supply. So uh, the tissue might be gradually dying along the measurement time. The first contrast we obtained is the OCT intensity. And by following the time course of the OCT intensity, we cannot see clear difference in the tissue structures. But once we computed the LIV, we can see that the outer layer of the spheroid shows high dynamics appearance, green, while the spheroid center shows red appearance, low dynamics. It is well known that the tumor spheroid exhibit a necrotic core surrounded by a proliferating layer of the cancer cell. So the high dynamics appearance at the spheroid periphery might indicate the living cells of the, uh, at the proliferating layer of the spheroid because of their sufficient nutrient supply, while the low LIV at the spheroid center might indicate the necrotic core of the tumor spheroid. By following the time course of the LIV, we can see the gradual degradation of the LIV signal along the time. And after 28 hours, almost all the spheroid region shows low LIV appearance. Our second contrast is the OCDSL. And OCDSL shows similar appearance with the LIV at 0 hour and 28 hours. By comparing the OCDSL and LIV at 0 hour, we can see that the boundaries between low and high dynamic signal regions are clearly observed in the OCDSL image. That's because that these two methods are sensitive to different aspects of the tissue dynamics. The LIV are sensitive for the magnitude of the signal fluctuations, while the OCDSL is sensitive for the speed of the dynamics. Our third contrast is the OCDSE. And OCDSE shows high uh, appearance at the spheroid center. And it was reported that the tumor spheroid core exhibited a fast decorrelation of the OCT signal, which is consistent with the high OCDSE appearance in this case. And by following the time course of this OCDSE, after 28 hours, we can see that almost all the tumor spheroid region shows high OCDSE appearance, which means high fast dynamics. From these results, we can say that the combination between low LIV, low OCDSL, and high OCDSE at the spheroid center might be called as a tissue necrosis signature. Let me explain about our second study. Here we used a human breast cancer, MCF7 cell line, and the medication was done using Texol. We seeded the tumor cells at day zero, and after four days, we applied the anti-cancer drug Texol with three, dif three different concentration in addition to the control sample. On day five, we applied the fluorescence markers and measured the sample by using the fluorescence microscope and the OCT microscope. This figure summarizes the results of the fluorescence microscopy and the dynamics OCT. In the fluorescence microscopy, the control case shows a living cell's appearance at the spheroid periphery as a green appearance and the spheroid center shows a dead cell's red appearance. In 5 nanomolar a case, we can see a clear clustering of a dead cells at the spheroid center, while the spheroid periphery shows living cells appearance. At higher concentrations such as 50 nanomolar, the spheroid volume became smaller, and the spheroid periphery shows a clear layer of a dead cells. By increasing the concentration more and more to 500 nanomolar, the spheroid volume became even smaller, and it shows more uh, dead cells appearance at the spheroid periphery and also at the center. By following the dynamics imaging in the control case, we can see a clear necrotic signature observed at the spheroid center, which might be consistent with the dead cells appearance in the uh, fluorescence microscopic image at the spheroid center. Five nanomolar case, we can see a clear clustering of necrotic signals around the spheroid center. In addition, there is some necrotic signature are observed around the spheroid periphery, which might indicate the cell death under the effect of the 5 nanomolar of the texel. The clustering of the necrotic signals at the spheroid center are also consistent with the clustering of the dead cells at the fluorescence microscopic image. In the 15 nanomolar case, we can see that the spheroid periphery shows a clear necrotic signal, uh, signal uh, with low LIV, low OCDSL, and high OCDSE. 
And this uh, signal degradation of the LIV OCDs L and the increase of the OCDs E is consistent with the uh, dead cell layer, which is observed in the fluorescence microscopic image. By increasing the concentration to 500 nanomolar, we can see a clear uh, necrotic signature observed around the spheroid periphery and also at the spheroid center. And this is consistent with the dead cell's appearance at the spheroid outer layer and also at the center. So uh, let me explain about three-dimensional dynamics OCT. Let me first explain what we achieved for the tumor spheroid uh, tissue activity evaluation. So far, we did a label-free imaging of the tumor spheroid by using the OCT. And the OCT has a few millimeter imaging penetration depth. So we have a, high, a sufficient image, imaging penetration depth for the tumor spheroid imaging. So what we still need is a three-dimensional measurement. In our cross-sectional dynamics imaging protocol, we repeated 350 frames at each location in the tissue in 4.4 seconds. And for the three-dimensional dynamics imaging, we need to, we need to measure uh, more than 100 locations in the tissue. So the old scanning protocol is not realistic for the volumetric dynamics imaging because it will require around 10 minutes for one volume. So we did an optimization analysis of the dynamics imaging parameters. We created the dynamics imaging by using a different combination of the number of frames and total acquisition time windows. And it was found that 17 or 33 frames are sufficient for the tissue dynamics imaging as far as the total acquisition time window is large in the range of 6.5 seconds. Based on this optimization, we designed a custom-made three-dimensional scanning protocol. We divided the emphasis plane to eight groups, and each group contains uh, 16 locations in the tissue. And these groups have been scanned by the raster scanning pattern. And the scanning pattern is repeated 32 times in uh, 6.5 seconds. And the same scanning pattern is repeated to the other groups. So uh, finally, we can obtain a volume of 128 locations in the tissue in 52.4 seconds. For the three-dimensional dynamics algorithm, the LIV has been computed at each pixel in the time sequence of 32 frames at each location in the tissue, and the LIV volume is uh, obtained. For the correlation analysis, the correlation uh, computation has been performed by using a special extended kernel of size uh, two times four pixels in the axial and lateral directions, respectively. Then the correlation decay speed is computed at the delay range of uh, 200 to 1,228 milliseconds. Let me explain some uh, validation studies of the three-dimensional dynamics imaging. First, we did a time course evaluation of the tumor spread. Uh, we used here that same cell line we are using, which is a human breast cancer MCF7 cell line. We seeded the tumor cells at day zero, and after 15 days, we extracted the spheroid from the cultivation and measured it using the three-dimensional OCT every four hours up to 20 hours. This image shows the volume rendering of the LIV, and it, sh it shows a clear uh, low LIV at the spheroid center which might indicate the tumor spheroid core necrosis, while the spheroid outer layer shows green appearance, high LIV, which might indicate uh, the living cells at the spheroid periphery. By following the time course of this volume rendering, we can see that the LIV signal is uh, degrading along the time. And after 20 hours, almost all the spheroid region shows a low LIV appearance. In addition, from this volume, we can extract the cross sections at uh, three different directions. And this cross section also shows the degradation of the LIV signal. And this uh, cross section can also uh, be compared to the standard microscopic modalities. The OCDSL volume rendering also shows a low OCDSL appearance at the spheroid center surrounded by high uh, OCDSL at the periphery. And the time course of the OCDSL uh, shows the degradation of the OCDSL along the uh, measurement time. And at 20 hours, a clear uh, degradation of the OCDSL at almost all the spread region is observed. 
The cross sections at these uh, different locations can be also uh, extracted and it shows the degradation of the OCDSL signal along the uh, measurement time. The quantification of the uh, time course MCF7 uh, tissue viability alteration has been also performed. The mean LIV signals in the entire throat volume shows a clear degradation along the measurement time. And the mean OCDSL also uh, shows a clear degradation along the uh, measurement time. And this degradation of the mean LIV and OCDSL signals might indicate the degradation of the tissue viability along the measurement time. The throat volume is slightly increasing along the uh, measurement time. And this increase in the throat volume might indicate the swelling of the uh, tumor cells during the cell death process. The viable cell ratio, which is the ratio between viable cell volume and the entire throat volume, has been also computed based on the LIV and OCDSL cutoffs. And it shows a clear degradation when computed based on the LIV and the OCDSL cutoffs, which might indicate the degradation of the uh, tissue viability along the treatment times. Our second study is a tumor throat drug response evaluation. In this study, we used two human cancer cell lines. The first is a human breast cancer MCF7 cell line, and the medication was Taxol. And the second uh, cell line was a human colon cancer HT29, and it's treated with SN38. We seeded the tumor cells at day zero in a 96 well plate. And after four days, the spheroids have been formed, and each spheroid is treated with one of these drug concentrations. And these spheroids have been extracted from the cultivation at these time points, and measured using fluorescence microscope and the 3D OCT microscope. Note that at each condition of the treatment time and drug concentrations, five spheroids have been measured. So let me show the response of the MCF7 spheroid to different taxol concentrations when the treatment time was three days. In the control case, the spheroid center shows low LIV and low OCDSL appearance, while the spheroid periphery shows high LIV and high OCDSL. This image shows a clear cell death at the spheroid center surrounded by living cells at the spheroid periphery which might be correlated with the low and high dynamic signals at the spheroid center and the periphery, respectively. In 0.1 micromolar case, the spheroid shape irregularity is observed. In addition, the dynamic signal is clearly decreased in almost all the tissue region. The spheroid shape irregularity is also observed in the fluorescence image. In addition, clusters of a dead cells are observed around the spheroid peripheries. In one micromolar case, the spheroid center shows low LIV appearance, while the spheroid periphery shows a diffusive appearance of low and high dynamics uh, or uh, low and high LIV signals. On the other hand, the OCDSL image shows a clear layer structure of low OCDSL surrounding high OCDSL and low at the center. The fluorescence image shows a clear uh, cell death around the spheroid periphery. And this cell death at the spheroid outer layer might be correlated with the degradation of the OCDSL signal at the spheroid outer layer. And it could indicate the attack of the drug at the spheroid periphery under the uh, 1 micromolar concentration. By increasing the concentration to 10 micromolar, a clear degradation of the spheroid volume is observed. In addition, the LIV and the OCDSL signals is clearly decreased in almost all the spheroid region. And the degradation of the LIV and OCDSL signal is also consistent with the increase of the dead cells at almost all the tissue region, as observed by the fluorescence image. From these results, we can see the alteration of the MCF7 spheroid morphology and tissue viability by increasing the taxol concentrations. Let me show the response of the MCF7 spheroid with the same taxol concentration, but at different treatment times. In the control case, at day one, it shows the low LIV surrounded by high LIV at the spheroid periphery. And by following the time course, at day six, the, sp the spheroid outer layer shows uh, more low LIV signals. And similar appearance is observed by OCDSL imaging. 
at 0.1 micromolar case, it shows similar appearance to the previous concentration at day one, but once we increase the treatment times, a clear degradation of the spheroid volume and the LIV signal is observed in almost all the spheroid region. And similar appearance is observed by the OCDSL imaging. In the case of one micromolar, again, it shows similar appearance at, at day one uh, for the previous concentrations, but once we increase the treatment times, a clear degradation of the spheroid volume is observed, and at day six, almost all the spheroid region shows low LIV signal. The OCDSL imaging uh, shows a clear layer structure at day three, as discussed in the previous slide, and at day six, almost all the spheroid region shows a low OCDSL appearance. At 10 micromolar case, at day one, again, it shows a similar appearance to the previous concentration with a, a necrotic core surrounded by a living cell layers. And by increasing the treatment time, a clear degradation of the spread volume and the LIV signal is observed. And similar appearance is observed by the OCDSL imaging. From these results, we can see that for each drug concentrations, by increasing the treatment time, it increases the tissue viability degradation. The quantification of the MCF7 spheroid response to Taxol has been performed. The spheroid volume in the control case shows a clear increase along the uh, incubation time, which could indicate the growth of the health spheroid, while the spheroid treated with the Taxol shows a clear degradation of the spheroid volumes along the uh, treatment times. The main LIV signal in the entire spheroid volume shows a clear degradation along the treatment times for all the drug concentrations. The necrotic cell ratio, which is the ratio between necrotic cell volumes and the entire vo spheroid volume, shows a clear increase along the treatment time for all the drug concentrations. And this could indicate the increase of the cell necrosis under the effect of the anti-cancer drug and for a long treatment times. The main OCDSL signal in the entire spread volume that also shows a clear degradation along the treatment times for all uh, the drug concentrations. The OCDSL-based uh, necrotic cell ratio is also uh, increasing along the treatment times, and this could uh, also indicate the increase of the necrotic uh, cells along the uh, treatment time for each drug concentration. It was reported that the MCF7 spheroid shows a clear degradation of the cell viability when treated with Taxol for different drug concentrations and different treatment times. And these results are consistent with our findings in this study. Let me show the response of another cell type, which is human colon cancer, HT29 spheroid, to the uh, SN38 concentrations. In the control case, the LIV image shows diffusive appearance of low and high uh, LIV signals, while the OCDSL shows a clear layer of low OCDSL surrounded by high OCDSL. The fluorescence image shows a clear cell death at the spheroid center surrounded by living cells at the spheroid periphery. 0.1 micromolar case, the spread volume is uh, smaller and it shows more low LIV signals. The OCDSL image shows a clear decrease of the necrotic core diameter, while the fluorescence image shows a clear uh, increase of the dead cells around the spread peripheries. At one micromolar case, the spread uh, volume is even decreased and it shows a more low LIV signals, while the OCDSL image shows smaller necrotic core diameter and the fluorescence image shows a similar appearance to the previous concentration. At the micromolar case, the spread center shows a low LIV, while the spread periphery shows, high, uh, shows a layer of high LIV. And this high LIV at the spread periphery might be uh, induced or uh, indicate the cell dis dissociation under the effect of 10 micromolar of SN38. And this cell dissociation may induce a fluctuations of the OCT signal with high magnitude, which gives a high LIV appearance. On the other hand, the OCDSL image shows a low OCDSL layer at the spheroid periphery. And this could indicate that the activity of the uh, cells at the spheroid outer layer is uh, too slow. 
the OCDSL images, uh, the, the uh, fluorescence image shows a clear uh, clustering of the dead cells at the spheroid periphery, which is consistent with the low OCDSL at the spheroid outer layer. And this could indicate the attack of the drug at the spheroid outer layers. From these results, we can see the degradation of the HT29 spheroid tissue viability by increasing the SN38 concentrations. Let me show this, the HT29 fraud response to the same SN38 concentrations, but at different treatment times. In the control case, at day one, it shows the diffusive appearance of low and high LIV signals. And by increasing the incubation time, it shows similar diffusive appearance and the fraud volume is slightly increased. On the other hand, the OCDSL image shows a clear progression of the necrotic core. And this could indicate the increase of the spheroid necrotic core diameter due to the lack of the oxygen and other nutrients along the uh, incubation time. In 0.1 micromolar case, a clear degradation of the spheroid volume is observed. In addition, at day 6, it shows a more low LIV signal. On the other hand, the OCDSL imaging shows a clear degradation of the necrotic core diameter along the uh, treatment times. And this degradation of the necrotic core diameter might be induced by the drug application, and this phenomena is under investigation. At one micromolar case, the spread volumes are uh, clearly decreasing along the treatment times, and the LIV signal is also degrading along the uh, treatment times. And similar appearance is observed by the OCDSL imaging. At the micromolar case, a clear degradation of the LIV signal is uh, observed along the treatment time. And at day six, almost all the fluid region shows low LIV appearance. On the other hand, the OCDSL uh, image shows a layer structure at day three. And at day six, almost all the fluid region shows a low OCDSL appearance. This might indicate the degradation of the tissue viability uh, by increasing the treatment time of the 10 micromolar uh, treated spheroid. It was reported that the HT29 spheroid shows a clear increase of the cell death when treated with the anti cancer drug, and these results are consistent with our findings. The quantification of the HT29 spheroid response to the SN38 has been also performed. The spheroid volumes at day 3 and day uh, 6 of the control case are larger than that of day 1, and this might indicate the growth of the health spheroid. And uh, again, the spheroid treated with the anti-cancer drugs shows a degradation of the spheroid volume along the treatment times. The mean LIV signal in the entire spheroid volume at the smaller drug concentrations is slightly increased from day 1 to day 3 and saturated from day 3 to day 6. And at 10 micromolar case, it's increased from day one to day three and uh, clearly decreased from day three to day six. And the LIV based necrotic cell ratio doesn't show a clear tendency at the lower drug concentrations, but at high drug concentration, it shows a clear increase from day three to day six, which might indicate the increase of the necrotic cells from day three to day six uh, when the spread is treated with 10 micromolar. In OCDSL signal in the entire fluid volume doesn't show a clear tendency at the lower concentrations, but at one micromolar and 10 micromolar cases, it shows a clear degradation along the uh, treatment time, especially from day three to day six. And the OCDSL based necrotic cell ratio also shows a clear increase uh, from uh, day one to day six at one micromolar and 10 micromolar cases. So uh, let me go to the discussion. So far, uh, we presented a cross-sectional and three-dimensional OCT-based tissue activity imaging method. And our method considered both the magnitude and the speed of the intracellular motility. So uh, these two si systems or these two uh, methods, LIV and OCDSL, are sensitive for different aspects of the tissue dynamics. So it can visualize totally different contrast as shown in these images. So these two methods are complementary to each other to, to understand the intracellular motility. 
In our three-dimensional dynamics OCT, the acquisition time window was 6.5 seconds, and the fitting range of the OCDSL is uh, from 0.2 seconds to 1.2 seconds. These time scales uh, made our method sensitive for the tumor's fluid cells uh, metabolic activity, which is well known to occur in a fraction of second to few uh, seconds. And this table uh, shows some activities in the uh, living cells, and it's occurred in uh, for the uh, phosphatase reaction, it occurs in a millisecond range, and for the protein conformational changes, it also occurs in a one, uh, one millisecond uh, scale. And the active and passive uh, protein diffusions also occurred uh, in the range from one second to 10 seconds. In addition, the adenosine triphosphate, ATP, is the main source of the energy for uh, many uh, processes in the living cells. And the ATP is consumed during the metabolic activity of the cancer cells. And by the metabolic activity imaging of the tumor sphroid, the ATP is observed to be concentrated at the proliferating layer of the tumor sphroid, while there is no ATP or a low concentration of ATP is observed at the sphroid center. As shows, sorry, as shows in, uh, as shown in a uh, uh, figure A and B. In addition, the glucose is also found to be concentrated at the living cells at the sphroid periphery. Dynamics OCT imaging shows low dynamics appearance at the sphroid center and high dynamics at the sphroid periphery. From this, we uh, derive the hypothesis that the dynamics OCT appearance might be related to the ATP uptake during the metabolic activity of the living cancer cells at the tumor sphroid periphery. In addition, we did a comparison between our method and the gold standard method. In the LIV and OCDSL imaging, the tumor sphroid core shows low dynamics appearance, and the bright field image shows the dark appearance at the tumor sphroid core, and the fluorescence imaging image uh, shows a dead cells appearance at the sphroid center. From these results, we can say that the dynamics OCT provides a tissue viability contrast, which is correlated with a standard method, but it is a totally label free. In addition, the dynamics OCT can mimic the fluorescence appearance of living and dead cells. By applying the proper, uh, proper threshold, we can uh, visualize the high and low, uh, the high LIV and OCDSL uh, signals. And from this image, we can see that uh, the, the high signals are concentrated at the sphroid uh, periphery. By observing the living cells frozen, frozen image, we can see that the living cells are concentrated at the sphroid periphery, which is correlated with the high dynamics appearance at the outer layer. In addition, by applying the lower threshold, we can see that the low dynamics region are concentrated at the sphroid center which is also consistent with the concentration of the dead cells at the sphroid center. So from these results, we can say that dynamics OCT can provide a tissue viability contrast, which is consistent with the live and dead fluorescence images. In addition, there are several uh, mechanobiological uh, imaging methods have been used for the uh, cell, uh, cell mechanical properties investigation. And the atomic force microscopy has been used for the investigation of the mechanical properties of the tumor sphroid. As shown in this figure, the, the sphroid in uh, image C is uh, stressed with 25 uh, down, downward displacement by using the AFM uh, tip. The force relaxation curve of the human breast cancer sphroid has been uh, plotted as, for, as shown in figure D. In addition, the sphroid deformation has been quantified and it was found that the larger uh, the sphroid, the smaller the deformation is observed. So this suggested that the viscoelastic response is mainly dominated by the highly uh, proliferating cells at the sphroid periphery. So this method can be sensitive for the proliferating cells at the uh, outer layer of the large sphroids. And although this atomic force microscopy high, has a high spatial, spatial resolution and high force sensitivity, it has several limitations. The atomic force microscopy is limited to the tissue surface measure measurement. In addition, measuring a few millimeter uh, a field of view requires a few, mil uh, few minutes acquisition time. In addition, 
The atomic force microscopy was uh, mainly used for the cellular scale uh, drug response evaluation. And there is no drug response evaluation of the three-dimensional tumor spread has been uh, proposed using the atomic force microscopy. On the other hand, the Dynamics OCT provides a depth resolved tissue viability evaluation of the sick cultivated uh, tumor spread. In addition, it provides a few millimeter imaging penetration depth with a few millimeter field of view. And it was used for the evaluation of the three dimensional uh, intracellular activity of the tumor spread. In addition, our method is totally label free and there is no any mechanical contact between the OCT probe and the sample. And our method shows a potential application in the tumor spread based uh, drug screening. Here I would like uh, to locate our method between the standard uh, microscopic imaging methods. For the genetic activity and protein expression uh, imaging, we can use the fluorescence microscopic imaging. However, the fluorescence image needs an oxygenous contrast agent, and it has a limited penetration depth. And for the tissue morphology imaging, we can use the standard microscopic imaging, such as bright field microscopy. But this method is only sensitive for the tissue morphology, and it provides two-dimensional imaging with low quantitative capability. And our method, uh, Dynamics OCT, can provide both the tissue morphology and also the tissue activity in a totally label-free manner, three-dimensional, and with a few millimeter imaging penetration depths. Here I would like to uh, conclude my talk. So uh, through this project, we proposed a cross-sectional and three-dimensional dynamics imaging method for the tumor fluid tissue activity imaging. And the utility of our method was investigated for the time course and drug response evaluation of the tumor fluid. The time course and drug response based tissue viability alteration of the tumor fluid has been also uh, successfully quantified. By the comparison between our method and the standard modalities, it shows a consistent contrast which improves the feasibility of our method as a fluid evaluation tool. And our method is totally label free and non invasive. So it might become a useful tool for precision medicine research. Here I would like to thank my colleagues, collaborators, and our funding agencies. And thank you very much for uh, listening. And uh, I have a special thanks for uh, my colleagues in uh, Damietta University for att attending this meeting. Thank you very much. Now uh, the defense is open for discussion. Um, maybe first committees uh, Professor Fukuda, please. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. I think that very uh, becomes wonderful, especially the history of the OCT, the including the dynamic OCT. I think it's very nice, so easy to understand. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Myeonjin, come on. <laughs> thank you, uh, Ibrahim. Very nice presentation. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, uh, I already read that your the previous paper and it was a little hard to understand at the beginning, but after watching this presentation, everything is getting more clear. And then, uh, yeah, I think that your work is very, uh, I think that quite useful in the future, the full, the measure, the any, uh, the measuring the any efficacy of the, the cancer, the drug. So I, actually, I have uh, already some like a practical question regarding the, your project. The one of the, yes. my question is, when you designed your acquisition protocol, I think that you need to specify the certain time interval the, between the B scan. So I think that you already the answer my question at the later uh, slide. You showed us some table, but I just want to uh -huh. hear from you. How did you determine uh, the the your the frame uh, interval in particular to getting the such kind of information. Oh, I see. Okay, so uh, let me show the scanning protocol and the previous slide. So uh, after this optimization, uh, we found that like uh, thirty two or thirty three frames can be sufficient for the uh, tissue dynamics imaging uh, with a good appearance as observed here. But the total acquisition time window uh, should be in uh, the range of 6.5 seconds. So based on this, uh, we developed this uh, scanning protocol. 
So uh, we repeated uh, 32 frames at each location in the tissue in 6.5 seconds. So uh, this means that uh, the uh, frame interval is 200.4 milliseconds. Okay, so the, my next question is gonna be, you can still the controller the uh, frame speed. Maybe you can use the less number of the A scan or B scan, where you can increase number of A scan per V scan. So you can consider that like a B scan uh, frame speed more like a the uh -huh. you can control the your B scan the frame rate. But is yes, it is when you choose the the B scan frame and then only considering the number of B scan for your each group? Uh, actually, that's uh, like a good suggestion. Uh, so uh, we can like if if we are going to uh, measure a very fast dynamics, uh, I think we need to uh, like to decrease the inter frame intervals to capture the uh, like the very fast uh, dynamics. But uh, as we was uh, observing, the tumor fluid uh, dynamics looks to uh, like uh, it seems to be uh, slow, or the metabolic activity can be uh, like in the range of a few seconds. So uh, the, the current uh, like scanning uh, design is, uh, I think it's uh, used for the uh, tumor fluid evaluation. But however, uh, if we are going to measure the uh, very fast activities, I think we need uh, like to, uh, to consider uh, like uh, decreasing the inter frame intervals and makes us, uh, the scanning protocol more, more fast. Okay, I see. So <laughs> Thank you for If I can ask one more question, can I ask one more? Yeah, please. Yes. Yeah, so I think that obviously next step of the year project is going to be try to using this kind of technology, at least uh, for uh, apply to the animal model. So the, when it compares yes. to the human, I think the animal is more easy to control and then more high chance to get in the, the data without any significant motion artifact. So yes. when it comes to apply your technique to the animal model, what's gonna be the limitation and then what additional step, what additional the process you might need to develop? So uh, uh, so for this, uh, like in vivo imaging by using this uh, method, I think the one limitation we can uh, like face is the, uh, like the bulk motion of the sample itself. So uh, for this, uh, for this, we need to uh, like compensate this motion uh, by applying this uh, motion correction algorithms and uh, the registration between the uh, different uh, B scans. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, uh, we need like, we require a pre-processing step, which is this uh, motion correction. And after that, we can uh, apply our uh, dynamics algorithms to uh, visualize such uh, in vivo dynamics imaging. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. So uh, which kind okay. of accuracy do you need to correct the motion? Uh, Actually, I uh, like I didn't have like experimental uh, data of such uh, like uh, in vivo uh, models, but uh, I think we can uh, if we apply the anesthesia or uh, something to the uh, animal model. I think that uh, like the uh, bulk motions will be uh, like very low. Uh, but uh, e even you apply the anesthesia, uh, still we have some pulsation and uh, respiration. Yes, Maybe, uh, you need to think about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, by the way, Myeongjin, uh, thank you for coming. It's going to be a very late evening. There. <laughs> it's not well. that late. Now it's 9.55. Uh, My kids are asleep, so I'm free to mm -hmm. do whatever I want. And yeah, it's very interesting. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, happy to join this meeting. Anyway, thank you for thank coming. You and, uh, Ibrahim, I, I have some question uh, which can be uh, potentially associated with Myeongjin's question. Yes. Um, Say uh, in one of his questions is a B scan and A scan density in the B scan, right? And yes. do you have any idea about the the impact or potential impact of the of the resolution or pixel separation to the dynamic imaging? So uh, the L, uh, for example, LIV and OCDS are they independent from the resolution or the pixel separation? The, uh, so I think the method itself is uh, like independent of the uh, resolution, but uh, like if we increase the uh, resolution, it will be uh, better to visualize more uh, like fine structures. 
but assume if the resolution is extremely good and the yes. coherence volume contains only a single scatterer, we don't have the speckle. So even in this case, uh. can you measure the dynamics? So like, uh, now, uh, I think in the your method, the current, uh, the current method of you assumes <laughs> Uh, there are sufficient number of scatterers in a coherence volume. Yes. Uh, means a fully developed speckle. So I think if the resolution becomes higher and higher, maybe it will violate our assumption. Can you comment on uh, this? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, because wh what we are measuring here is a uh, uh, speckle fluctuations along the uh, acquisition time. So if the uh, resolution is uh, like very high, as uh, we can measure uh, only a single uh, scatterer in a coherence volume, I think that this might be one limitation of our method. Uh, I think we can, uh, like, I can make a simulation for this. Uh, or, uh, or maybe you can, uh, you can apply that the intentional defocus. Yes. Your old resolution or the retrieve the beam diameter. To the objective. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, you can think about it for the future project. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, any other question uh, from audiences and also committee members? Thank you very much. You need one about one minute to get the images, 3D images. Yes. Uh, what hardware or protocol should be improved to measure more faster? I mean, more short time to get. To measure of uh, like uh, faster dynamics, I think the, uh, like uh, we can uh, like just uh, like develop a software which is a scanning protocol. So I think uh, the hardware itself is not uh, like a problem, but we can uh, like uh, optimize our scanning protocol and uh, design this uh, software for the scanning uh, scheme. And uh, with this, we can like increase the uh, like the scanning speed of the system. Mm. That is. Depends on the hardware. Uh, I think that uh, so the uh, so the scanning itself, uh, like the scanning speed of the uh, itself of the system, is like uh, fifty kilohertz or uh, fifty thousand a lines per second. Mm. So uh, this is only uh, only our limitation of this uh, like hardware. So the uh, one a line is captured in zero point uh, zero two uh, milliseconds. Yes, uh, so we, we cannot uh, like go lower than this uh, acquisition for single ally. But as uh, Professor Myonjin uh, like suggested, we can uh, like decrease the uh, number of a lines per B scan or so to the, to to uh, like to increase acquisition speed. Okay, uh, Ibrahim, let me restate Professor Ito's question. Yes. Uh, assume we have a very high speed OCD system. So in this case, uh, we can fully use the benefit of that high-speed system. Uh, means we can reduce the measurement time or not. Uh, my question is: uh, Assuming we have an extremely high-speed OCT system, and uh, whether we can reduce the measurement speed or not, or is there any other limitation? Uh, but I think with this, uh, like with this system, we can increase the measurement speed. Uh, but uh, in uh, like our limitation is the uh, activity events uh, what we are observing itself. So uh, if we uh, are planning to measure a very fast dynamics uh, such as blood flow or something, so we need a high speed OCT systems. But uh, for this uh, like a fresh ex vivo or uh, in vitro uh, like uh, model such as tumor fluid, I think. Uh, the acquisition in the range of a few seconds uh, might be uh, sufficient for this uh, evaluation. Uh, so, uh, so maybe, uh, this doesn't answer to my question. So my question is that uh, if the system is fast, we can make the measurement fast or not. So it's, uh, uh, what I'm talking about is uh, whether it is possible or not. Yeah, I think it's possible. Uh, uh, so you mean uh, even that the uh, activity is slow, you can uh, do the high speed measurement. It's a conclusion. Uh, what, what actually, uh, what you talked uh, in the answer to the Professor Ito's question was uh, about a high speed measure, a high speed activity, right? What I'm yes. particularly interested in is uh, slow activity, like a metabolism. 
Yes. So the metabolism is slow as you've discussed in the defense. Yes. Assume if we have a very high speed OCD system, we can measure it. We can measure it uh, with a small or what say short acquisition time or not. Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, can, can, measure what, can, can you show me the slide 37? This study doesn't conclude like this. It doesn't conclude like this. A short measurement time, like a 0 0.82, the first row of this figure doesn't give us a significant image. Yes, so uh, just uh, because uh, like the, uh, the w with this uh, like acquisition protocol, we need a uh, like large time window. So the uh, so th this means uh, no matter how the data density, you need a long measurement time. It's a conclusion yes. of this line. Right? Yes. So um, uh, what the limitation and how we can overcome it? So a uh, year three dimension measurement protocol uh, just circumvent this problem um, by say, um, using the intermediate time during the scan to scan the other location. Yes. Right? Mm. Uh, if you are interested in only in a single cross section and uh, we would like to measure it fast, what we can do, or maybe even we can restate it on uh, like the in vivo animal model has a respiration and a pulsation. So if you okay. can measure the tissue activity fast, it might be better. We can ignore about the respiration and the pulsation. Now, uh, my question, and maybe also Professor Ito's question, is that whether we can do it or not. So in this case, we don't need to think about the bulk motion. I see. But so I think that uh, the only one limitation here is uh, like the activity we are measuring. So. Uh, so if you uh, like, if we are measuring a very slow activity, uh, I think we can uh, like we have the freedom to make the acquisition time window large. But if uh, like the activity is very far, we don't. I, I think we don't have a freedom from this slide. What we can conclude is that we don't have a freedom, but we need to make uh, yeah, the oh. more time window large, and we yes. would like to avoid it. The point is, uh, we don't we don't want to use the large time window. And, uh, uh, and the first question is whether we can do it or not. And the second question associated with this is why? Like the high speed activity should be sampled with a higher sampling rate, higher than the Nike's limit, right? But uh, if we are talking about a low frequency activity, Maybe this can be, in principle, this can be captured by slow acquisition speed or the uh, slow acquisition rate. So then mm -hmm. what we can do this? Uh, what the problem uh, or, or in the future, how we can solve? So, uh... So I think we need to uh, like optimize our uh, scanning pro protocol by the uh, sparse signal acquisition as uh, like uh, our colleague uh, Rion is doing. So I think um, uh, the sparse signal acquisition still relies on a long measurement time window, right? The sparse yes. signal acquisition is actually aims to have the long acquisition time window. Really. Uh, it, it's actually the violate our assumption now. So we would like to avoid a long acquisition time window. And uh, uh, actually, uh, what, I, what I'm talking about is uh, uh, not only whether we can do, uh, say, I don't, uh, you don't need to answer how you can do it. But uh, if it is hard or not possible, I would like to know why. What the real limitation? of using a short time window, like a 0 0.82 in this slide, 
to capture the slow metabolic act uh, slow activity like metabolism. In principle, mathematically speaking, it should be possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. The the, uh, the activity doesn't exceed the next limit. And then why we cannot? So in my understanding, you've already partially answered to this question in your first paper, POE 2020. And the second point was uh, maybe not really we understood yet. But uh, by carefully checking our recent activities, including the Rion study, maybe we, gra we have grabbed something already. Maybe uh, as a hint, uh, there are two points of understanding. So, for example, in your first paper, 2020 BOE, how did you define these images are sufficient? I mean, there are 6.55 and 17 frames and 33 frames. And actually, uh, you define a cutoff, right? Yes. How did you define the cutoff? So uh, the cutoff for the dynamic signal itself, uh, it was like uh, empirically defined. But uh, how did you? Okay, uh, it's it's not uh, it's not objectively defined, but uh, we did uh, it based on the data, right? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so by uh, checking the uh, uh, like the dynamic signals at the spot center. Uh, the average dynamics at this center and the uh, histogram of these uh, like uh, regions uh, it shows uh, like this uh, like the uh, the uh, LIV and OCDSL cutoffs can be uh, like uh, selected as 3db for the LIV 3db squared and uh, 0 0.0002 for this uh, OCDSL imaging. Uh, 3db from what? Uh, 3db for uh, like the LIV cutoff. No, no, 3db from what? db scale is just a relative uh, db scale. Uh, uh, db squared. Yeah, but uh, how do you define 3db? I think you need to double check it. It's your paper. As far as I remember, what you did is compute a standard deviation at the homogeneous region, potentially homogeneous region, and uh, try oh, to try. yeah try to select the cutoff to separate two regions. So yes. the standard deviation is a noise, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mix it between the cutoff of the, of the uh, dynamic signal uh, to, to visualize the uh, like the viable anti cells and the cutoff in this case. Again, uh, so, what data limitation? So the uh, Current limitation is uh, like the uh, getting uh, like uh, an acceptable uh, dynamics imaging contrast. So can I say that again, please? So uh, getting an uh, acceptable uh, dynamics imaging contrast, or uh, uh, what, what you cannot, why can, uh, why you cannot get it? Why can't you, uh, why can't you get it? In principle, if the activity is slower than the next limit, we can measure it, but we cannot in reality. And then why?
that's something you need to tackle in the future, right? Yes, sure. The signal to noise ratio. Mm. So, uh, like we need to consider the uh, noise in the uh, like the LIV and the OCDSL computations, maybe. Um, uh, the other point is uh, uh, that something recently Rion tackles the LIV. The definition of the LIV itself pretty much depends on uh, acquisition time window. So the LIV is in its definition depend on acquisition time window. Yes. So we need a modification of our algorithm itself. Mm -hmm. Maybe these remind I mean, these two are something we need to tackle. Yes, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any uh, any other questions from audiences and also committee ne committee members? Please come up. Okay, uh, Professor Terada, please. Hi, thank you very much. I think I'll ask about I'll ask about the principle of measurement, and you show. You propose three quantities, which uh, are the, which which are LIV, OCD, L, OCD, S, signal, and both mm -hmm. and all of them. OCD, S, L. Yeah, all all quantities measure the fluctuation of the row OCD signals, right? Yes. And and you claim that the. Uh, but you didn't show the biological mechanisms for uh, the fluctuation, which related uh, fluctuation to the, you know, the, <laughs> the no. and the so, tissue dynamics. So, yeah. can you explain the more deep, uh, deeper biological mechanism for? The observed signal or observed fluctuation. I mean, uh, I'm not familiar with the biological cell structure and it and their motions. So, yeah, let me uh, let me uh, let me restate a question. So, uh, the Ibrahim uh, just explained that uh, say something like a collocation of the signal and uh, uh, tissue activity, right? But uh, yes. you didn't explain why that tissue activity, like a metabolism or ATP consumption, results in a fluctuation of OCD signal. So the one hand is a kind of physiology, right? And the other hand is the signal processing. So in something between, we have some physics. So how does the ATP consumption, for example, result in a signal fluctuation? The ATP consumption is something like a chemical process, biochemical process, but the signal fluctuation is a physical process. Uh, yes, so I think like uh, during the metabolic activities, there is also some uh, like uh, like dynamics, e like dynamics event uh, such as uh, like the diffusion of this uh, like prote protein diffusion, and uh, this is also one uh, like of the. Uh, uh, like uh, how to say uh, ATP uptake. So here, this uh, proteins take uh, like the energy from the ATP, and it is diffused uh, from the outer, from the extra uh, cellular space to the intracellular space. And uh, there is another type uh, which is called uh, like passive transport. And this uh, like don't need this uh, like tissue uh, like this ATP energy, uh, but it's uh, like this passive. Uh, uh, like this passive transport or uh, passive uh, uh, diffusion, it is uh, like follows the second law of the uh, thermodynamics. It's like uh, flows from the uh, higher concentration region to the uh, low concentration regions. So I think uh, like there's uh, like several dynamics forces as observed here. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, this is still a kind of chemical process. But now why does it alter the optical signal? Uh, I think this is uh, like a kind of motion, and this uh, like the motion of the scatterers can like uh, fluctuate the OT OCT signal uh, along the position. What is a scatterer? 
So the, uh, the intracellular organelles are uh, like supposed to be the scatterers of the OCT signal. In, 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 your, in your explanation, the intracellular organelles doesn't involve, uh, were not involved. So what you're talking about is a membrane transportation. Yes. Uh, I think uh, that's a core point of Professor Terada's question. The metabolism, okay, and the ATP consumption, okay. But uh, how does it relate to the alteration of the physical signal, or technically the optical signal? Okay, uh, then that split the problem into two. Uh, for the first part, uh, Professor Fukuda or Professor Matsaka, do, do you agree uh, with his understanding of the first part, the activity transport? Is his understanding acceptable? Uh, Professor Fukuda or Matsaka? Um, can, can you, a I, comment I, I'm not sure the detail about because I'm not professional. Maybe it, Professor Masada is more the professional. So Professor Masada, do you have comment? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure in this dish. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, nobody here didn't think about this. <laughs> so to be honest. <laughs> sorry. Uh, but and, uh, uh, then uh, regarding that, Professor uh, Terada's point, it's kind of, uh, there might be uh, some physics uh, involved, and that physics connect the biological activity to the optical signal, right? Yes. Uh, so maybe and the optical process. This can be and uh, this can be involved. Are uh, two. The one is scattering, and the other is a refractive index change. Yes. In your opinion, it's a scattering change. But, uh, if the density of chemicals alters, in my understanding, most of the, uh, mo uh, uh, most of the cases it appears as a refractive index change. So for me, uh, mm -hmm. your explanation are controversial within within your your explanation itself. And uh, microorganelle suddenly appeared. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I see, uh, like I think I need like more deep understanding about the cell biology, and uh, maybe after and uh, like after deep understanding of such uh, like uh, motions inside the single cell, uh, we can like uh, derive a model or, or uh, make a model of this uh, like uh, intracellular motion and connect it with the uh, dynamics uh, or the OCD signal alteration and how we can uh, like extract the dynamics from this motion. Yeah, okay. Uh, your point is, I actually are uh, quite well convinced by your point. So maybe uh, in the as a next step, we need to think about uh, the model, the simplified physical and a mathematical model to explain the chemical, mathematical, and a physical model to explain uh, or to connect the biological activity to the OCT signal fluctuation. But in my understanding, yes. David, David Boas was doing something uh, yes. similar. Uh, mm. It's a dynamic scattering. Dynamic scattering. scattering. Uh, yeah, mm. Their model is based on the, the complex signal, complex OCT signal. But uh, maybe you can adapt that, that uh, their approach to yours. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I so totally agree with Professor Yasuno's opinion, and I ask, uh, I ask that because it is very important to uh, de determine your the sensitivity or limitation of your method, mm. and you know, in any meaning. So it's very important. So. Yeah, it's a I recommend one. <laughs> think deeply, more deeply about that. Yeah, uh, yes. thank you, Professor Terada. Thank it's you very, very much. And uh, it's surely uh, worth to tackle, and uh, even uh, can be a very good paper in the future. Making a model and a clarify the model, and a chemical and a biological and a physical model, 
the scattering model and I connect to the OCD. So once we have the model, we can uh, we can solve the inverse problem from OCD to the metabolic activity. So in anyway, uh, don't be uh, so depressed by this. And actually, uh, if you can answer to anything at the end of your career, so what we are talking about is uh, whether you can uh, stand on the, uh, the start line of your real research career. OK, and if you can uh, if you can uh, correctly answer to anything, actually uh, that the end of your career uh, in a good meaning or uh, actually even at the end of the history. So we spend a thousand more than a thousand years uh, to answer to a single question and are still in, a, in our way. And uh, I, I believe uh, I and also you cannot uh, reach to the goal within our lifetime. So you don't need to uh, so depressed about this, but uh, the clarifying the problem is a first step to solve the problem. Thank you very much. OK, uh, so then uh, tentatively, I would like to close this session. And thank you, Ibrahim. And uh, we committee you. members uh, will shortly leave this meeting room. And uh, we are going to have a short meeting uh, only with the committee members and uh, make a conclusion. And uh, Ibrahim, please uh, stay here. And if the other members are interested in uh, something like a scratch card result of his defense, uh, please stay. Uh, please stay here in this meeting room. Ibrahim. Yes. Can I just ask you, yeah. like, uh, because we were discussing here an out of interest question, like why does this uh, spheroid need CO2 in the beginning? Is this for nutrition or why, why does it get CO2? Uh, so uh, to get what? CO2. Uh, CO2. Uh, yeah, uh, I think the CO2 is uh, like the source for the ox oxygen. So we need uh, like we need to support uh, CO2 and uh, with some uh, like uh like reactions or intracellular reactions uh they can like uh take the oxygen from this co2 supply for uh, like uh keep the cells are uh survival mm, okay okay thank so, you yeah thank you okay anyone uh maybe professor ito is still in the committee room okay he's coming uh, so uh, we committees, uh, including I, uh, Yasuno, and uh, Professor Ito, Terada, Fukura, and Matsaka, uh, discuss uh, 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 discuss about uh, trade defense. And actually, uh, we don't have any uh, objection you to take a PhD. So uh, our recommendation to the university is go. And uh, maybe it's a little bit. Uh, I I think it's not that really too early to say that. But uh, uh, hold on. Uh, it's not really too early, uh, but uh, we need still we need uh, some official approval process. But in, anyway, I would like to congratulate you. Uh, congratulations. Thank you Dr. very much. And uh, uh, I you. hope uh, you will continue on uh, your hard work and uh, establish uh, your field. OK, yeah. uh, it is definitely not, it, this is not my field, but uh, your own field. So when I uh, like uh, when I was a PhD student, I was working for that uh, inform optical information processing, and it becomes an OCT, and uh, people recognize OCT is uh, my field, not Professor Yatagai's field. But uh, it, uh, actually, in reality, what I was doing is uh, optical information processing. So maybe dynamics OCT it becomes like yours, okay? So you've been working for the OCT. That was my field. But uh, this on, um, say, in vitro tissue assessment or dynamic OCD, or maybe it will change the name in the future, will become your own. OK, now you have your own field and you can develop it. Thank you very okay. much. And uh, continue work hard. And uh, anyway, uh, congratulations, Dr. Al Sarek. Thank you very okay. much. So the, uh, uh, his overall defense is uh, closed. OK, uh, thank you for a participant. Actually, uh, some of you are coming from a uh, very, say, uh, uh, say, strange time in your country. But uh, actually, I really appreciate your participation. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, uh, some of, uh, there are some uh, PhD students in the other universities. And I hope uh, you can have uh, this honorary moment 
quite soon, within a year or two. OK, uh, thank you for all of the participants and our committee members and uh, Dr. Elsarek. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.